Okay, turn with me to Romans. Where? Anywhere you would like. <laughs> Go with me to Romans chapter 1. Hallelujah. You know, the New Testament is set up of three categories. The first is the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then that deals with the life of the Lord. And then we go into the book of Acts, and we see that, you know, the Holy Spirit was given and the church was started. And we have the Great Commission there. And then, you know, we go into the epistles, and Romans is actually the first epistle. And the book of Romans was actually... Um, it's the longest letter that Paul wrote, a single letter. And here in chapter 1, he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son, who was born of the descendant of David according to the flesh who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul is making this really clear from the very beginning that he is talking about not only the Lord Jesus Christ, but his Lord. And then he goes on, he says, Among whom you are and have been called of Christ Jesus to all who are the beloved of God, in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, we see there that Paul, number one, he wants us to understand who he is first. It's just like who you and I are. If someone used, if, if I introduce myself, I would say I'm Pat Lawrence, and then I would say I'm pastor of Living Grace Church. What does that mean? It, and so what Paul was saying here is he says, first, I'm a servant. And this word servant actually means it's talking about in their culture, this word that was used is talking about a slave. And this particular slave in this particular time was talking about a love slave. What is a love slave? A person that once you were a servant of this particular master, you would work for them for six years and on the seventh year, you would be released. Now, if you chose not to be released, you would then have your ear pierced, and then everyone would know that you are there on your own. You're there because you wanted to be with your master. And he's wanting you to know, first and foremost, this is who I am. I am Paul, and I am the servant of my Lord and master. I mean, just that right there, I could... Stay there and preach for a little while. He says, uh, and I've been set apart for the gospel, so he makes it very clear why he is set apart. He's not, God didn't just set him apart for anything. He set him apart for a reason. The gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his uh, prophets and holy scriptures. And then he goes down in verse 4, and he says, who declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. In other words, Paul is telling us here, look, church, I want you to know. And when Paul was writing this letter, he was actually in Corinth, and he penned this letter, and he had not gotten to this church as of yet. A lot of people think that more than likely in the book of Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit was given and Peter goes back, then this church was actually started because of that. Now, do we have exact knowledge of that? No, but that is the history of it. And so here, what Paul is saying is that in this church to the Romans, Paul is wanting them to understand. I want you to understand that this has power. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then it goes on and it says in verse 5, through whom we, and here we is talking, Paul is talking to them. And so here in the first chapter, Paul is actually talking to the Gentiles. But he's talking to them as a we, as in we as believers now. And he says, through whom we have received grace. See, Paul was wanting them right off the bat to understand you've already received this grace. Glory to God. It's not something you have to work at. If you did, you'd fail. It's not something you earned. If you tried to earn it, you would fail. It's, it, the grace of God was given to us. Isn't that awesome? 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, through that you've received grace and the apostleship. See, this is something that Paul received in the word apostleship there is your calling. This is what he was set aside to do. So see, the grace of God always comes first before the calling. Amen? Amen? Are y'all awake? My goodness. Okay. I'm preaching good up here. Y'all need to say amen. Among whom you are called by Jesus Christ. And he goes on and he says, now grace and peace to you. Notice how grace always comes first. Why? It had to come first. You can't have peace without what Jesus did. Amen. And then he goes on and he goes on uh, 8 through 10 and he talks about, you know, it shows the heart of Paul for this church how that he longs to be with them, how he's wanting to be with them. And he gives us three things. In verse 11, he says, just what we did. He said, I long to see you, that I may impart some gifts to you, that you may be established. See, that is exactly what we just did this morning. We prayed over you. We laid our hands upon you. Why? So that you can be more established. See, there's an anointing in God's word. And this is what Paul told Timothy. And this is what Paul was telling the the church here in Romans and Rome. And he says, and to be encouraged together. Paul wanted to so be with them. Why? This this was his homeland. This was where his people were. This is where his probably his family and friends were. He so wanted to be with them. And then if you drop down to verse 13, he says, so that I may obtain fruit. From you as I have done the rest of the Gentiles. What is he saying? He's wanting maturity. He's wanting to see what has Jesus done in you? What is it the Lord has been doing with you? In other words, you know, God is the vine. Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. And he's saying, how are you connected? What is it that the Lord has been doing with you? And so he's, he's telling us that there. Now in verse 14, he says, He goes on, he starts talking about the three things that he is. Verse 14, he says, I'm a debtor. And verse 15, he says, I'm eager or I'm ready to preach the gospel. And then in verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed. So what was it that Paul was a debtor to? He's not a debtor to God, and God's not a debtor to him. Why? Because Jesus Christ fulfilled that full debt. Amen? But he was, he's telling them that I am a debtor to the Greeks and the barbarians. (laughs) The barbarians are not what we would think of today. It's just people that did not speak their particular language. But, but a lot of times, you know, we, we read things in that are not here in the United States. But um, in verse 10, uh, 15, he says, so my part, I am so eager. I am ready to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And see, as Paul wanted to preach, just like you, you're going to want to take the gospel of what Jesus Christ has done for you, and you're going to want to move forward in that. Amen? And he's saying, this is what I want from you. And then in verse 16, and he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why would God, Paul, why would Paul tell us that? Why, why is he saying something like this here? I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Paul, none of us are ashamed of the gospel. Because at times you're going to want to be ashamed of the gospel. You're going to be ashamed. At times, Paul is saying, look, I am ready, I am eager, and I'm obligated to come to you, and I'm going to preach the gospel, but I need for you to understand, church, that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ Jesus. And he's telling, he says, it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then in verse 17, it says, for it, what is it there? That's the gospel. What Jesus did for you is, it says, is the righteousness of God to be revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, for the, the righteous man shall live by faith. So again, Paul is, he's, he's really moving us along and saying, now look, you know, and even in verse uh, eight, he was saying, look, your faith is known throughout the whole world. He's telling them, look, this is good. What you're doing is good. But you know, Houston, we have a problem. And he's about to get into it. So let's look at verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So we see right here that there is a wrath of God. And where does the wrath of God go? 
it goes against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men. And it even tells us why. Why, God, would you send your wrath, it tells us, to suppress the truth. And then he goes on, he says, verse 19, he says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood, though what may have uh, has been made, so that they are without excuse. I mean, I don't know how you can read that and not understand it. But, you know, in the church circles, a lot of times that people want to take this and say, well, you know, that's for people that only, you know, if you're only called of God. See, there's, there's so much here because in verse 18, he tells us the wrath of God is going to go against the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. And why? He tells you because you have suppressed the word of God. You suppress the truth. You cannot take a lie and put it as truth. And then he says, see, he's talking about all men. Here, all men know that God is God. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter if you live in the, the backlands, the wetlands, the lowlands, whatever, wherever you are. God has put this in men's heart. He says, because that which is known, so they do know about God, is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. God is the one that has shown every single person. So a person can't come to you and say, yeah, I don't believe in God. You can say, well, that's your belief. But the scripture says God, God has put that in you and you do know it. That's exactly what this has just said. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. That's pretty clear, right? Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, so from the very beginning, God has made this clear to every single person. His invisible attributes and his event, uh, eternal power and divine nature. And look what it says how they see it. They have, it says, has been seen clearly seen and then it goes on and it says being understood so they not only see it but they understand it at some time and point every man woman and child knows God that they know God they know his trinity and it even goes on here to say that being um, his attributes which is the trinity of the head it says that here that that they would have seen that and the attributes of God. They know God. So when a person turns from God, they have suppressed the truth. You know, it's like a beach ball. You take a beach ball and you push it down in the water, right? That's going against nature. That's going against what it was meant to do. And that's what happens when we take the truth of God and suppress it. God says, no, no, no. When you do that, that's ungodliness and that's unrighteousness. And see, there's the wrath of God there. So see, we want to think, oh, there's no wrath. Well, what, let's just tear this page out of the Bible too. You know, we, guys, listen, we've got to learn to listen to what the word of God tells us. Amen. I mean, we've got to, st I'm staying on it. I'm not moving from it. Now, verse 21, it says, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were hardened. Now, I want you to recognize here that there's, there's a progression as people move forward in these things. So we're starting to see that some people start to suppress the truth. Now he goes on and he says, now these people, they don't honor God. They don't give thanks to God. You know, if I go out and I make a million dollars, oh, hey, that's all about me. They're not thankful to God. You know, they're, they're, they're thinking, oh, it's all about me. Look at me. Aren't I wonderful? If it wasn't for the wisdom of God that God had put in you, you would never be where you are today. Oh, Jesus. Foolish hearts. 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. This is what God is saying about it. 
Now look what it says, verse 22. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in forms of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. See, they exchanged the truth, the incorruptible God, the truth of God and who he really was. They exchanged it. They took, they took the lie, not the truth. And instead of taking the truth, they just exchanged it. And God says, you are in a foolish place when you do that. And so what is, this is adultery. And here Paul is talking to, in Romans, that look, you know, I know you bunch of heathens, you know, you bunch of Gentiles, and the Jews. The Jews are not getting off scot-free because we're going to talk about them in chapter 2. But, so, and, and Paul goes on in chapters 1, 2, and 3, and he says, look, not only the Jews, but the Gentiles, and then the whole world is guilty before God. And what does he tell us? He tells us that we all need a Savior. We all need a Savior. And you know what is so amazing is that God provided us with a Savior. I mean, you know, we just, I, I just am so thankful. But as I'm going through this, guys, listen, I know that God's timing in this teaching is so important. Because there's some of you that I can just sense it in my spirit that you've got family and friends that are starting to walk down in this darkness. And you need to know where in Scripture that it's at. You need to know what does it mean. You need to be able to pray and ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me to share. When a person is exchanging truth for the lie, pretty soon their mind starts to go that way. All right, now look, let's, let's read it, uh, 24. Therefore, God gave them over to the lust in their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonorable among them. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, I've had people talk to me. Yeah, but why would God do that? Look, God is a just God. He's a righteous God. These are things that are unrighteous and unholy toward him. So when, when they decided, I want to make an exchange, the Lord said, so be it. He would not be God if he did not. He says, look, I've given you the opportunity, just like he talks about in Deuteronomy. Look, this day I have put this decision before you. This day you choose, church. We've got to choose what the Lord wants us to do, or we're going to exchange what the Lord wants us to do with what the world and what our, our fleshly lust is going to want to do. And the Lord says, don't go there, because what's happening here is this person is slowly moving toward the wrath of God. It says in verse 25, now we're going to get into some deep stuff right here, so just see, put your seatbelt on. It says, for they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And worship and serve the create the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And now remember, they've made an exchange. This is their choice. Okay? Now look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to a de to a degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function from that which was unnatural. See, right there, that tells me that any lesbian that chooses that lifestyle, they have chosen, they have exchanged the truth for a lie. So be it. I'm going to go on. I'm not just finished with the women. I'm going to talk to the men, too. And at the same time, also, the men abandoned the natural function of a woman and burned in their desire toward uh, one another. Men with men commit, committing uh, indecent acts and receiving in their own persons a uh, penalty due to the errors. And you know, we have AIDS. We have all these types of diseases and things that happens. Why? Because that is, listen, guys, if you know someone that is going through this, these scriptures, I pray, will help them. If they will take the truth and walk with the truth. But if they've exchanged the truth for a lie, the scriptures tell you that their mind is going to move forward and being a fool. That's just where their mind is going. But keep praying and keep declaring the word over them. Amen? All right. So, again, it says that they've exchanged it. See, this is not, see, a man or woman is not, when God created a man, 
he created a man. When he created a woman, he created a woman. There's nothing that, you know, you don't get to pick and choose your, your own gender. God, your creator has picked your gender. You know, you may not be happy with that. Oh, you know, probably why? Because you don't know your Lord and Savior. See, you've taken, you've exchanged the truth of what God's done for you to the lie that the enemy is wanting you to believe. And you know, you know, all of the, the theology that comes out about, you know, the different sexes and things like that, I listen to them, but in their hearts, I can hear that cry because just like Romans 18 through 20 tells them that you know there's a God and you know the difference between right and wrong and you totally understand it. Now, somebody can stand and lie to you or they've totally went over and God has turned them over to a retrobate mind. All right, verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. <sighs> See, this is where this person is progressing and moving forward. They've decided that they don't even want to acknowledge God anymore. They are moving way far out of that range. God gave them over to a deprived mind to do those things which are not proper. Being filled. See, this is what this person, as they're moving forward in this, being filled, these are the things that will take place. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder. What is murder? Taking an innocent life. Abortion. Murder. You're murdering. Uh, what? You're taking an innocent life. God gave life. We do not have the power to take it. God gives life. Amen? God gives life. These are the things that in your mind as you're moving toward this, you're going to see that these things are okay. Envy, murder, strife, uh, malice, deceit. They are gossipers, slanders. What's the difference between a gossiper and a slander? Where a gossiper whispers, they don't want you to hear them. But a slander, they'll bite you in the back and tell you about it. I'm telling you. And see, they don't care anymore. They've decided, I'm going to move away from God. See, and again, I want to tell you, this is their choice. And it's not something they don't know. They do know. Slanders, haters of God, arrogant, boastful, boastful and inv um, inventors of evil. <laughs> How many things do we see on the internet that, oh, are so horrible? Disobedient to parents. See, this is not, this is not an age limit here. When Paul is talking to this church, he's saying, I'm talking from the very youngest to the very eldest. There's not an age, and I'm wanting you guys to all know that this is how you need to raise your children up so that they will know and the wrath of God will not. They, in other words, this is something that they need to know. This is wrong and this is right. God has put it in their hearts, but you as parents enforce that. And how do we enforce it? Through the word of God. Amen? He says, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. This means that, you know, you've gotten to the point to where not only do you not care anymore, but if you see someone else hurting someone else, you just don't care anymore. This is not a good place to be. And although they know, see, they know, even if they're to this point, they still know. Church, are you listening? Even though they get to this retrobate mind, they still know the difference between good and evil. They still know because God has put it in them. Just because you suppress it and just because you try to tell me that you don't believe in God, I know because of Scripture you do believe in God. But you suppressed it so, so much that, and for so long because God is a long-suffering God. He's not going to do this at a twinkle of an eye or a snap of a finger. It is, it's going to be something that you have chosen over and over and over. And at some point, God's righteousness, God's justification, he will step in and turn you over to the exact thing that you're desiring. That is not the place to be. Amen? Oh, glory. And although they knew, verse 32, the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. 
they not only do the same, <laughs> but also give heartily approval to those who practice them. I call this birds of a feather flock together. You know, they go and find. Because you look in the world today, whatever you are, you can find more of you. And so what God is saying, and then he goes into chapter 2. And, you know, <laughs> when I was reading this, I just thought, Lord Jesus, help me. Because I just thought, how am I going to get this across to the congregation? Here in verse uh, 1, let's read chapter 2 and go in 1 through 4. Therefore, you have no excuse. Now he's talking to the Jews. How do we know that? I'm going to show you. Therefore, we have no excuse. You have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgments and that which you judge, you condemn yourself. For you who practice, you who judge, practice the same thing. Now, look at verse 2. And we, so this is Paul talking. He's a Jew. He knows. He knows what they're thinking. And he knows what they're doing. He's, he's already heard this. And so now he's talking to the religious Jew and he's saying, look. You know, you think that because you're a religious Jew that you're going to get off scot-free? He's about to tell them that's not going to happen. And we know that the judgment of God uh, rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppress this? <laughs> oh, man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same things yourself, that you would, ex would escape the judgment of God. Paul is coming out with all barrels. He's coming out. He talked to the Gentiles. He talked to the church. Even, because see, he knew where they were from. He knew their background. He knew that they were into adultery. He knew they were into homosexuality. He knew all of those things. And he's saying, look, I need for you to listen to what I'm telling you. The, Jew the religious Jews, then he comes and tells them, do you think? That you're going to get, you're, you're going to get a, you know, pass go card. You know, you're not. He said, I'm telling you, the judgment of God comes upon us all. But what is so amazing is the next verse. He says, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and the tolerance and the patience, not knowing that the goodness of God leads people to repentance? Glory to God. That's grace right there. Glory to God. That's grace right there. See, it's amazing to me because I just, you know, I think, Lord, we so much needed that. And so what Paul is saying is that I'm talking to the Gentiles of the church now. Now I'm talking to the religious Jew. And then pretty soon he goes into chapter 3, and I'm going to start reading in verse 19. So here he's talking to the world. He's talking to the Jews and the Gentiles, the, the religious, the non-religious, the people that are in the church, the people out of the church. And then he tells us why he chose... <laughs> Why God chose to give us the law, verse 19, Romans 3, 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be accountable to God. Verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For though the law comes through the knowledge of sin... See, the law, what that law did, it brought you to the point that you realized, I am truly a sinner. Because I cannot, the law was never made for them to be able to walk in it. They could, the only person that did was Jesus. The law was brought about to tell us that we need to keep our mouth closed when it comes to saying, oh, I'm honorable. You know, I can do this, Lord. You should credit me for this. The Lord says, no, that is not something you can do. That is not anything that you would ever be able to do. Because of the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Through the law becomes the knowledge of sin. Now look at 21. Now this is talk, talking about our faith. But now, thank God Paul is moving on saying, oh, how do we do this? But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the laws, by the law and the prophets. 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. And look at verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short 
of the glory of God. Oh, Jesus. So now that you've taught us this far, and Paul is bringing us this far, that we've all become sinners, and we need some type of way to justify that. Look at 24. Being justified as a gift. See, this gift to you, this grace that Jesus gave to you, that justified you, it was a gift. It is not something you earned or could ever earn. It doesn't matter how many times you came to church, if you joined the choir, it, you know, it, if you give, if you don't give, if you serve, if you don't serve, if you're the best mom, if you're the best dad, whatever that may be. No, it says being justified. God made sure that this get was a gift to you by his grace through the redemption, which is in Jesus Christ. It says 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. In other words, this is something what Jesus did and how Jesus did it became sacred to God. It was something that God received because of what he did. And it says, and in his blood, through faith, this was the demonstration to demonstrate his righteousness because, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. You know, I've had people talk and they'll say, well, you know, if God really is in this world now, why doesn't he show himself? Why, he does, why doesn't he demonstrate something to us? How much more do you need him to demonstrate other than giving his life for us? Wow. And then not only did he give his life for us, but it says that God chose to pass over mine and your sins and the sins of the whole world. Glory be to God. That's the demonstration. It says, for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be justified, would be just, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. I'm telling you, church, listen, we're moving into different times. We're in a different world. But then in Ecclesiastes, the Lord reminds me and takes me back that, Pat, there's nothing new in this world. You know, it's new, and I, it's new to you and I, and it's new from 100 years ago, okay, or 50 years ago, or maybe you're just 20, and 20 years ago, you know. I mean, it, it, there's really a lot going on. But what God has said is that every man knows me. You know, so no matter who you come up against, you've, you know, let's go back. Your homework is to go back. Go through chapters 1, 2, and 3 here of Romans. Read it, study it. There's so much in there. I mean, I call it the steak on the plate. I mean, I do. The book of Romans is just so full. And he's, he's teaching us, really, the book of Romans is for everyday life. It is for everyday life. It takes everything that Jesus did, and Paul puts it systematically in order, and he shows us how to walk through it. Amen? Isn't that good to know that we can walk through this world knowing that what Christ has done for us is more than enough? Amen?